mobile hunters, are you looking to make the move to saddle hunting this year? Or maybe you just want to add a few new pieces of gear or upgrade your current saddle gear. If that's the case, then head over to tetherednation.com where they've got all mobile hunters covered. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old timer, Tethered is your one-stop saddle shop. From saddles to ropes, sticks, ascenders, whatever it is you need, they have you covered. I've personally been using their gear for the past three seasons. Now, my base setup consists of the Phantom Saddle and the Predator Platform. And if you're wondering why I've chosen to use their gear above all else, here's the cliff notes. They're innovative and pushing the mobile hunting forward overall. They cut no corners and prioritize the safety and performance of their gear. They care about the community that they've created, and their gear allows me to hunt free. And above all else, I like to support good people doing good work. If you're interested in upping your mobile hunting game, then head to tetherednation.com. This podcast is brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. For those of you that don't know, Skull Brew Coffee Company is a business that my wife and I started to give back more to conservation. We donate a portion of our profits back to conservation organizations and are 2% for conservation certified. Since Earth Day is coming up soon, we thought we'd go ahead and kick off the celebration with a store-wide 10% discount. This includes all of our single origin coffee, single pack pour overs for hunting, camping, and travel, and all of our merch. Visit SkullBrewCoffee.com and use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and get your savings and let's support conservation together one cup at a time. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 225. Today I'm joined by Nathan Keelan, and we are talking Appalachian Mountain Bucks of Virginia, so stay tuned. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you were doing well. Hope you were feeling fine this middle of April 2021. It's hard to believe that uh, April is here and a lot of folks, man, are kicked, you know, obviously have kicked off turkey season. I think I even mentioned in the last podcast, our buddy John knocked down his Osceola. I just talked to him this past weekend. He is in the, I think he's in Idaho right now uh, doing some elk shed hunting and scouting. And then I believe he's headed to the Black Hills. Uh, to try to bag his second turkey of a of a back to back slam, uh, so hopefully hopefully he's having some success out there, and uh, and I'm sure we'll have him back on here in the not so distant future to see what's uh, to see what's shaking with that. But uh, as far as uh, as far as my you know white tail or outdoor excursions go. You know, this past weekend was actually pretty fruitful. Um, I you know, won't necessarily dive into the details. There's a podcast that'll come out here in the next week or so, probably next week, actually, that kind of details that. But this past weekend was really kind of headed back up to northern PA. Uh, you know, weather, obviously, a little warmer, so there's not, you know, there wasn't any snow up there and, and, and so forth this time. And so made my way back there. Um, actually was joined by my buddy Aaron Hepler. You've heard him on the podcast before. He's a Pennsylvania guy. Uh, he was, you know, might have heard him on uh, Tony Peterson's podcast, and he's he's done some writing and stuff for some folks as well. So um, he he joined me, um, staying in the uh, in in the, in the purple camper, purple trailer, and uh, we had ourselves a a full day of scouting. Um, like I said, I'm not going to necessarily give away the details. That we'll we'll share that on the on the podcast. But what I will say is. Um, things are trending in trending in the right direction. Uh, so we definitely, it was a little bit more fruitful than it was the last time. I won't go as far as to say that we, um, have it figured out, um, uh, necessarily. Um, but it was definitely a step, um, a step in the right direction as for local, you know, things, you know, related to, to, to local kind of hunting and scouting and so forth. Um, next weekend or the upcoming weekend, you know, I'll have some, I should have some free time. And uh, there's one more spot that I want to check that's that's local that I didn't get to last year. And it's I, I was around the area, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, I scouted around the area and found some really good sign. And I think I mentioned I found a, a primary scrape area that was, you know, in a very overlooked kind of area. And there was, you know, an interesting I'll just call it an interesting a place of interest, shall we say. There's always suspects of interest or a person of interest during a crime. This is a place of interest um, that I had seen on a map. And I just never got to it last year. And, um, I, I, I kind of started skirting the edge of it, I guess two ish, maybe even three weeks ago. Now at this point, whenever I was over there initially kind of scouting some other kind of Oak flats and stuff that I didn't get to the year prior. And, uh, there was some decent sign there, but I really kind of was interested in this one area and I just kind of got, 
got late getting over there and I, I you know really wasn't dressed to to kind of break all the brush I was going to need to to, to, to break to, to kind of get through it. So I kind of backed out and made plans to kind of go back, you know, whenever I had a little bit more time because I I I have a hypothesis that one of the deer that I was on last year that disappeared, I my hypothesis is that he spent he spent time over in that general area. Um, so I'm curious to see what sign is laid down over there. Um, and we'll plan to hang, hang some cameras in that, um, in that general area. Um, I'm really just kind of interested to see it's, it's close to like a private property line. Um, and, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, you always have to run the risk of, you know, are the deer going to spend enough time on the public or whatever the case is, there's not really, there's not crop fields or anything on the public or on the uh, private side. So I'm not so concerned about, you know, um, like a, their bed to food pattern per per se of like them betting on the, um, them betting on the, on the, on the private or anything like that. Of course, pressure will be a consideration as to how much pressure, but this area, just as my first kind of glance. And as I kind of, I walked in it, you know, maybe a hundred, 200 yards, you know, as I started kind of checking out to see if it was something I wanted to look at further and it's gnarly. And, um, you can, it would be really, really hard to hunt the private side, uh, like border of it you're likely going to have to hunt like the North side of it. Um, and that is not necessarily an easy place to easy place to get to. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably not a lot of, a lot of pressure on that particular little section. There'll be pressure around it, which I think for that piece, that particular part will be good. Um, uh, because I think it will, you know, innately kind of move deer in that general direction. And I'm guessing, you know, my hypothesis is that buck might've relocated, you know, as he shifted in that part, I don't know that, that he called that home, but I would venture a guess that might've been part of his, his kind of core area when he shifted. Um, and I would also venture a guess that part of the reason why some of the ac buck activity I had on camera early kind of dwindled in, in this one area, um, was because of pressure. And I wouldn't be surprised if the, if it moved a lot of those deer that I had on camera that disappeared into this particular area. Cause I feel like it probably doesn't get touched nearly as much. So that's my hypothesis going to do some scouting and see I've been wrong before, but I always kind of like to have a working idea of what might be going on. And I'm just as happy to, um, uh, to debunk it as I am to confirm it. Um, so either way, you know, I'll know more than I, more than I know today, but with that, we're going to go ahead and just jump into today's podcast and not uh, belabor this upfront too, too, too much longer. Have a super cool show to, uh, for you today. This is part number one, uh, with Nathan Keelan, we spoke for probably about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, something like that. So it's kind of a lengthy podcast. So I broke it into two sections. Um, in this first session, say, if you don't, if you don't know about Nathan, I would, I would get hip to him pretty quick. Um, as he is, um, a big buck killer and he's doing it in the Appalachian mountains in Virginia of all places. Right. So when you think of big deer, a lot of times you don't think of, of, of Virginia necessarily. Um, Nathan's made a habit of killing big deer in the mountains of, of Virginia. He does do some traveling. He spends a little time in West Virginia, a little time in, in, in Ohio and so forth, but he's, you know, born and raised in Virginia and that's where he cut his teeth. And that's where he does a lot of his hunting. And by and large, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he does, uh, I, most of his hunting he does do, I think some muzzle litter and so forth, but a lot of his hunting is done with, uh, um, with, with traditional archery equipment as, as well. So he's a savage, a big buck killer has a ton of knowledge. He's been doing it for a lot of years in the mountains. Um, and it's just been kind of really interesting for me to kind of talk to him prior to like some of the stuff I've been scouting in Northern PA. Um, because a lot of things I've talked to him about as well as like how blood and Todd Mead, like a lot of these things are ringing true and, and, and they're, and I'm able to apply it whenever I head to this Northern piece in PA and, and get into these bigger wood sections. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get Nathan on the line. And as always, thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the truth from the stand deer hunting podcast. And today I have on a, a gentleman who I've been following for a little while. Um, I, 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 you know, heard tell of this, this fella, um, big woods hunter, um, hunting in some, some tough terrain. And that's something that's been, uh, I guess something I've been kind of embracing more and more probably like the past five, five years. And so I've been kind of trying to find guys that I think get it done at a high level and have a lot of really good information and knowledge to share. And, uh, and this, this gentleman was gracious enough to come on the podcast and I'm talking to another, another, none other than uh, Nathan Keelan. How's it going, man? Going pretty good. How about yourself, Clint? I'm doing all right, buddy. Did I say your last name right, man? I always hate when I butcher someone's last name, but I think I said it correctly. Was that right? 
Yes, killing. Yep. Uh, right. A lot of guys say I have an awesome last name. To be a deer hunter, so. <laughs> That's right, man. I would, I would, I would agree with that. And it's fitting, man. As far as like the uh, the, the pictures I've seen, some of the stuff I've read, and some of the stuff I've listened to, I think it's a very uh, a very fitting name for you. But before we jump into all the kind of deer hunting talk, man, because there's plenty of it to get to, you know, that I want to get to with you. Um, I just, you know, for those out there that maybe aren't familiar with you or haven't, you know, listened to any, any other podcasts that you might've done or read any of the writings that you might've done, um, just let folks out there know, you know, where you're from and kind of what you do for a living. So they get a little bit of a sense of, of your background and who you are. Well, of course, my name is Nathan Killen. I am 47 and, uh, I live in the Southwestern part of Virginia, uh, not too far from Bristol, Virginia. If, uh, you know, where, mm-hmm. you know, you, uh, familiar with the Bristol race. Yep. But that's just about 45 minutes from where I live. And, uh, but, uh, I've been chasing these, uh, mountain whitetails for nearly 40 years now. Um, but, uh, I am a, uh, maintenance operator at a power station. Hmm. And, uh, so putting, putting, uh, electricity out there on the grid for everybody. So we, 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 we certainly uh, appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, it's certainly, yep. hel- it's certainly helpful, you know, having, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast, of course, with, with, without that, it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We can, uh, uh, it's, uh, hard to do without electricity whenever, uh, you as full as we are for it. So, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it, it is nice to get away once in a while. You know what I mean? I will, I will say that, you know, this past weekend I was out and, uh, living in my little trailer with the dog for a weekend of scouting. And, um, you know, no cell service and stuff like that. And you just kind of forget how nice it is when people can't get a hold of you and you can't be bothered. And there's, you know, there's no light except the stars or the sun or the moon or whatever the case is. It's, uh, it's just kind of nice to kind of leave it all behind, but it is, it is nice to get back to civilization and take a warm shower and have, have the normal creature comforts that we've all grown, grown accustomed to, I guess. But, uh, I know you, we were just talking before we hopped on and started recording, man, like you've had a little bit of a change in terms of your, uh, your schedule and stuff like that for work, um, which really kind of, uh, allows you to kind of get into the timber a lot, a lot more, man. I'm, I gotta say, I'm pretty envious of, uh, <laughs> of your current schedule and current work kind of schedule. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's much better than it used to be. Uh, you know, being in the power industry, you know, every fall we have a, uh, fall outage and what that is, is we, you know, shut the units down and, uh, we're able to work on things that we're not, uh, normally able to work on, you know, while we're running. And unfortunately, usually those start the 1st of uh, September and run up until the first week or two of November. So, mm. you know, during those, yeah. during that time I'm working, you know, uh, a lot of times 12 uh, hour days, seven days a week. So it really cuts into your hunting time. Right. But uh, things have definitely changed now and uh, uh, for the better, of course. So a lot more time. Yeah. And, that's... Uh, and and you know, being able to scout a lot more too, you know, which is very important. So, and yeah. this is my definitely my favorite time to be in the woods. Nice. So, how did you kind of get started hunting, man? Was it was this something you know you've been doing it a long time? Is this something that was kind of like a family a family thing where it was, you know, you were kind of almost born into it, where it wasn't even a question whether or not you were going to be a hunter, or was it something you kind of you know was interested in? Or how, tell me how you, I guess you kind of got started. Well, uh, me and my dad, you know, started together, really. He, he wasn't a uh, deer hunter, you know, uh, before I came along. And, uh, but it, it's something, you know, he enjoyed squirrel hunting and stuff like that, you know, growing up and shooting 22 rifles and stuff like that. But he was never a deer hunter, you know. Right. And once, you know, uh, I came along, you know, uh, he got the urge to want to go hunting. And uh, we, uh, a friend of my grandfather's, you know, took me and dad under uh, his wing and, uh, and, you know, we've, we've been hunting together ever since, you know, so, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, God has put something in my, into me, a passion for chasing whitetail since I was, you know, just very young, because as soon as I got a taste of it, man, uh, it, it's been all that I think about ever hmm. since, you right. know, so it's, um, it, it's, it's just part of me. So, right. And I know you shoot, I know you hunt with a traditional bow too, right? Is that correct? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah, I've been shooting traditional equipment on and off since the mid nineties, and uh, but I've, uh, I've been shooting traditional equipment only for several years now. So right, and of course now I enjoy you know uh, hunting with firearms a little bit too. You know, right? So. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm all about you know all means of all means of take. You know, I probably primarily hunt you know with a bow. I'll even hunt with a bow during gun season, and you know 
muzzle loader season and stuff like that, at least around around here where I live. Um, not for any other reason that I just enjoy it and I can, so I do, you know, I guess. And I live in a kind of, oh, yeah, I live, in a, I live in a suburban area too, or a lot. I live in the suburbs of a pretty big metro area and a lot of the land that I'm hunting around here, at least it's close to my home, um, are smaller parcels. And so your setups really probably aren't as, uh, probably more geared toward being able to hunt archery year round than it is maybe necessarily gun hunting, so to speak. Um, certainly right. plenty yeah. of guys do gun hunt around here. Um, but what I've kind of found just with the amount of pressure we have around here and stuff like that, they're really going to be in these pockets. Um, and if you can find where those pockets are at, you know, you're going to have an archery shot essentially. Um, right. so, yeah. you know, so I usually just kind of take the, take the, take the bow out, but, uh, you know, how's your scouting been this year, man? I know, you know, I know you've been out getting after it, I guess. I mean, that might be a, an appropriate place to just kind of start the overall kind of deer, deer conversation, you know, just kind of curious, you know, what your, what your process is for kind of you know, dissecting the, the big woods, so to speak, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I know you do a lot of shed hunting, you know, are you kind of, you know, picking out certain areas? Are you trekking to new areas? Are you kind of going back to maybe familiar pieces and kind of seeing what sign has been laid down and maybe what has changed since maybe the last time you hunted it? I guess just talk to me about your overall kind of approach to, to, to prep for an upcoming season. Well, uh, you know, I always, uh, re-scout, uh, areas that I hunted the previous year, especially, you know, if there was bucks that I was hunting and, uh, I know that they made it through season, you know, of course I'm going to go in and, and, uh, uh, you know, try to locate their sheds and also, you know, dig into areas that, uh, I won't, wouldn't go into, you know, during hunting season, you know, places that I've kind of put off limits. Uh, and, you know, so this time of year I'm able to go in there and, and actually locate, you know, exactly where the deer have been bedding and, and stuff like that and uh and also you know branch out into new areas i i try to keep you know at least four or five areas uh, uh what i might say scouted up you know and ready for hunting season you know the following year that way i always have something to fall back on to you know right. and of course you know they have to have what i'm looking for uh you know in those areas before i would even consider hunting them you know but that's you know that's part of why we scout you know yep um finding nothing is just as important as finding something, you know? So, right. uh, yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, a lot of shit hunting and, uh, just scouting, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean that the, the whole idea of finding nothing is finding something. I think that's something that's, uh, you know, overlooked a lot of times. Right. And so if that's the case, man, that I was in the chips this past week and finding nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I certainly found a lot of places not, not to, not to be, you know? Um, yeah. But, you know, you take, you take the good with the bad and there's always something to kind of learn. I shouldn't say I found nothing, but, you know, the piece was brand new to me, you know, to the tune of, I think that particular chunk itself was around 80,000 acres, you know, probably, and I know in the area that you're at, you know, probably more vast than that, but for around here, Northern PA getting up toward the Poconos, it's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty sizable chunk for this area. Um, yeah. And, uh, just, I was running into terrain and stuff like that, that I just hadn't had, had a lot of familiarity with where it wasn't a lot of topography. It was a lot of, a lot of tops and swamps on top. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of like real distinct terrain features that were going to move deer necessarily. Um, and it, I, I've never been to like Maine or anything like that and hunted the big woods in that type of area, but it kind of made me think of that because it was just, everything was very homogenous. It looked the same, felt the same no real landmarks, no real significant terrain features and stuff like that. And so it was challenging. I, I came back a whooped pup uh, essentially, uh, but chomping at the bit to kind of get back at it and, and, and redeem myself. I kind of made a, a new plan, so to speak. And uh, we'll see if that, if that plan kind of uh, bears fruit or not in the next, in the next few weeks. But, you know, speaking of kind of different areas, I, I know you're in Virginia. I know you hunt a couple of different places, right? But you're from Virginia, yeah. right? You know, and, and since you've had the opportunity to hunt different areas, you know, some West Virginia, maybe some Ohio and stuff like that, you know, what is it in your opinion that's the biggest kind of difference or habitat difference maybe between, you know, maybe some of the big woods pieces you've hunted in other states to maybe, you know, the Midwest or whatever the case, the, the case might be like, so if I'm not mistaken, you're hunting Appalachia, right? Appalachia in Virginia, like the Appalachia mountains, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So what, like, I guess, what is, what do you feel is the biggest difference between hunting that and other places that you've hunted potentially? 
Well, uh, you know, here in the mountains of Virginia, you know, we have uh, it's extremely thick uh, everywhere, especially in the areas that I hunt. You know, I I would. Do you know what uh, you know what mountain laurel is, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the areas that I hunt are probably seventy five percent mountain laurel wow. and, and uh, rhododendron. So, you know, uh, it's it's very thick. Uh, you know, the elevations, you know, will go anywhere from. And this, I'm speaking from where I hunt, anywhere from twenty five hundred feet up to nearly six thousand feet. You know. Wow. And uh, the deer populations are, you know, uh, relatively low compared to, you know, uh, some of the well, I've actually never hunted uh, any further west than uh, the middle of Kentucky. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, the the deer population here in the mountains is a, a considerably little bit lower than some of the other places that I've ever hunted. But, uh, you know, the of course, the topography is different. The deer density is different. Uh, and even the uh, type of habitat is different as far as, you know, what uh, you would consider, you know, thick ground. You know, like southern Ohio, where I hunt, you, know, you have timber cuts mm-hmm. and uh, there is no, uh, you know, that is the thick areas or, you know, uh, cedar thickets, you know, uh, stuff like that, you know, whereas the mountains, it's not like that. In West Virginia, you know, down there where I hunt some, you know, you have rhododendron and uh, some mountain laurel, but it's a whole lot of open timber too, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, you have uh, some uh, uh, reclaimed mining, uh, you know, strip jobs and stuff like that, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Habitat definitely varies quite a bit, you know, from area to area, but you know, the deer generally act about the same, so right, not a whole lot of difference. Right, yeah, that's some s- significant elevation, uh, getting up to six thousand feet. Like that's, you know, like where. <laughs> just curious, like you know, is there a point at which you know where you start to see even with low deer density? I'm, you know, I'm familiar with that in an area that I that I hunt. So I totally get that. But is there an area in elevation kind of marker or demarcation where deer just don't spend as much time above this type of elevation line? Have you kind of seen any, any of that or is it, or are they just kind of anywhere and everywhere? You just no. Find it? Yeah. No, there, you know, uh, I don't think we have high enough elevation here in Virginia that that would ever, you know, come into play. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, um, uh, one of the bucks that I killed uh, the year before last in tw- uh, 2019, you know, he was he was right at 5,000 foot, you know, hmm. elevation, and uh, uh, and I know of another buck that uh, you know where he bedded was nearly 6,000, you know, so uh, no, that they definitely use up that high, and you know, it just depends on where the food is, you know, uh, right. around here, you know, acorns is the number one food source for the deer during the uh, you know fall and winter and uh you know the where the mass crop is is sometimes elevation dependent you know sometimes okay. you uh, you know it's it's low sometimes it's mid mountain sometimes it's you know up high so you know that really drives where the deer are going to be you know from year to year right so <clears throat> that's it's interesting you kind of kind of went there because that was kind of where i was going to next because you know a lot of the places that i do hunt you know, even whether they're big woods or whatever, it's, it's a lot of, there are cuts, you know? And so, you know, for example, this piece in PA, like whenever I was kind of doing my study and there, I was looking at some of the, you know, game commission maps and stuff like that to understand, you know, like where are some of the cuts located, where maybe some, you know, uh, oak forests located and stuff like that. And there weren't a lot of oak forests necessarily. And so I was really kind of relying on those cuts to kind of provide, provide food, and a lot of places I go, like that's kind of where the food source will be. And so does your, would you say your strategy revol- revolves around two things like bedding and then finding where those, where those oaks are dropping? Is that kind of a fair assumption or how do you, how do you cut that? Oh, ab- absolutely. Uh, you know, and of course some years we don't even have an acorn crop and that, that really complicates things. You know, that to, to me, that's the worst case scenario because mm-hmm. your deer are so spread out, you know, that they're very hard to locate, uh, you know, best kind of, best case scenario, you know, if you don't have acorns is, uh, you know, being an area that has some grass because, you know, then the deer start getting those type areas, you know, pretty hard. But, uh, yeah, you know, you, uh, uh, where deer bed, uh, fluctuates a whole lot less than where they're feeding. Right. You know, uh, because, you know, our mountains aren't that high, you know, uh, 
even though, you know, we have some that, you know, uh, right at 6,000 feet, you know, the bottom of that mountain is only like, you know, uh, you know, 3,000, 3,500, you know. So generally somewhere in the, uh, you know, from the bottom to the top, you're going to find, you know, acorns that they're going to be there that year, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, even though it seems like a, a big elevation uh, difference, you know, the deer still tend to bed in the same general areas uh, every year, uh, even though the acorn crop, you know, may fluctuate in, uh, you know, where it's at, unless there's just, you know, it's very, very spotty and the deer have to move, you know, to maybe another uh, part of their home range to find food, you know, right. then their bedding is going to move quite a bit. But, right. You know, so some of these bucks, you know, their home range, matter of fact, one that I was uh, going to hunt this past year, I took, uh, you know, in consideration where other people had seen him and picked up sheds and, uh, and uh, where I picked up sheds from him and where, uh, you know, um, trail camera pictures had been taken of him. And, you know, his home range, you know, that I know of was nearly, you know, 22, 2300, uh, you know, square acres. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, like two things came to mind as you were kind of, kind of mentioning bedding and you were talking about consistent bedding and there's, you know, and we, we might be able to talk about a specific parcel offline that we both have some familiar familiarity <laughs> familiarity with, but like you, you said, consistent bedding and I've struggled to just in all truthfulness and finding consistent bedding whenever I'm in, when I'm in the big woods, like there's certain pieces that I've hunted where, you know, it almost seems like it's random, you know, and I know mature deer don't bed just at, at random, but man, in some of these places, it just feels like they just got tired and laid down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and then I, I have found some worn down beds, but you know, and I've maybe placed trail cameras like around these and stuff like that to see like when they're being used and how consistently they're being used and stuff like that. But I've all, I've almost always felt like those worn beds in that, in the one piece of big woods that it was almost rut bedding. Cause I could almost always find it in relationship to like a scrape or really close or adjacent to doe bedding or something like that to where I felt like it was really rut bedding and less like their consistent, you know, fall range bedding prior to, prior to rut, you know, is any of that, do you see any of that or are you, or are you really seeing like consistent bedding where those bucks are using like those same beds over and over and over again? No, I, to be honest with you, I, I find very few beds that, uh, uh, I feel like a buck is using consistent enough that, you know, that you could, you know, catch the right uh, wind direction and have total confidence that you could go in there and at least see him. Right. You know, uh, whenever I, I'm talking about consistent bedding, I'm talking about, you know, uh, bedding areas within a buck's so home. Yeah. Bedding, bedding okay. areas. And, you know, this, this area could be five acres. It could be a hundred acres or, right. you know, bigger. You know, but now he'll have more than one of those type, you know, spots, you know, mm -hmm. generally, uh, you know, these uh, uh, mountain bucks, you know, that they have almost an oval uh, like uh, home range, you know, and, you know, it, it might take them a day or two or longer to, to make that circuit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it depends on a lot of variables too, you know, you know, like early October. You know, uh, once the white oaks uh, or the acorns are starting to hit the ground, I think that buck's core areas shrink down extremely small. And, you know, I think that's one reason that uh, during that time period it is so hard to get their pictures. You know, right here all through the summer, you've, you've been getting their pictures. And uh, then all of a sudden, velvet sheds and they disappear. Well, it just so happens that, the, you know, not too far after that, you start having you know, acorns and stuff dropping. So these bucks, they really shrink down their uh, core area uh, small, and you stop getting pictures of them. You move cameras around. They're hard to pick back up. And uh, But I feel like that if you do, then you have found where he's at, but now it's a short window opportunity there, you know. Right. Because once we start moving closer into November, you know how those bucks are. They start, you know, uh, yeah. spreading out, uh, you know, opening up their home range and, uh so, you know, I think that it's, you know, based on the time of the season, you know, early October, they're going to be in smaller areas. Once they start uh, into November, then they're going to start using more of their home range. And, you know, they may be in bedding this one thicket for a day or two, and then they're gone half a mile away for a few days. You know, just going from doe family group 
doe family group because here in the mountains you have pockets of deer and you know mm-hmm. i think that uh uh you know that he just goes from pocket of deer to pocket of deer now once it gets uh, into december you know or well i'm going to say around the first of the year then you know uh these bucks you know that they start really focusing on uh um, food heavily and they're traveling very short distances and uh and then that's whenever i start seeing the really wore out bed you know because okay. that they're you know they're not going very far and they're coming you know they found a food source they want to bed close to that food source far. to kind of reserve that's calories right. right they don't want to move as they want yeah. to move as little as possible right <laughs> Yeah. That's right. And and even though, you know, uh, these bucks have really large home uh, or uh, bedding areas within their home range, I think that, you know, uh, because they're a solitary animal, their bedding is more precision than, say, a doe would be. Right. So, you know, they're going to be most likely bedded on a point or, you know, something like that, whereas a, a doe, you know, family group, they're going to be, you know, they could be bedded on a flat and the wide open woods, you know. Mm-hmm. So just because it sounds like their uh, um, bedding areas are very uh, random and, and big, I, I, they're very strategic within those places where they'll bed, you know. Right, right. No, that makes sense. I, I mean, do you find, you know, a lot of the common maybe knowledge or consideration you know whenever people start talking about buck bedding and and i'm glad you kind of mentioned and said that you know look look, you're looking at bedding areas because i think sometimes people get frustrated you know that maybe are newer at trying to you know hunt beds and stuff like that and they're trying to find a specific bed and like we all know like sometimes you will and there's some guys that, that they do a lot of that you know like guys like you know Andre DeQuisto comes to mind, right? Like he's he's really good at that. Dan Enfault really good at that, right? They they will kind of hunt a a particular bed, but even Dan, when I've talked to him, and I'm glad that you've said it, is like he hunts a bedding area just like as you kind of mentioned, like finding a single bed is sometimes you you just don't, right? And I think some guys you know get frustrated because they're not finding a bed, and they think that's the only way to bed hunt. Where it's really like you're trying to hunt their core area where they're spending the most amount of time. That's the bedding area that they're spending time in. They might have multiple places that they're bedding you know, based on wind or whatever the case is, you know, so I'm just curious, you know, have you seen any consistency for you, you know, at a particular like elevation where you found a lot of consistency where they bed or a type of terrain feature where you found, you know, consistency where they bed and it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, but it's like, you know, yeah, you know, if I'm going to look for a bed and a new piece, it's like, it's this elevation usually seems to be the ticket. Cause a lot of people kind of will subscribe to that, you know, uh, top third. And I, and I think it's effective, but I think there's a lot of places that I've found where it's like they've bedded in the bottoms just as much as I found them bed on the top, the top thirds of, of ridges. So it, what's your kind of thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, again, where the food is, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like, uh, you know, here in the mountains, uh, you know, I find most consistent bedding on secondary ridges you know, coming off of main ridges. And generally it, you know, depends on the uh, uh, topography of the ridge, you know, uh, as to where they'll bed on it. You know, a lot of the secondary ridges come off, they'll have a little saddle in them and then they'll make a little knob and then it drops straight off. Well, those knobs are fantastic places uh, for beds or for bucks to bed, you know. And generally it is off around the eastern side of that knob, you know. And, uh, and you will find, you know, a lot of beds on the opposite side, too. You know, sometimes deer uh, are, you know, do bed wind-oriented, and I and I do believe bucks are uh, way more likely to do that than does. But you, you'll find, you know, beds all around those types of places. Mm-hmm. And then also in the top one-third, just like you mentioned, you know, it, you know if there is cover present, you know. Right. Uh, in my part of the world, you know, most of these bucks, they want to bed in cover, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they. it might not be so thick that, uh, you know, that you can't walk through it, you know, but there, there's going to be some cover around, you know. Right. And um, so, but as far as elevation, no, not really. Just, you know, it just really depends on the topography, you know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, it's it, the, how they choose where they be in. Right, it's it, wherever the good stuff is. Right, <laughs> wherever, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. wherever right. it's at, that's 
that's where you can find it. Right. And I want to circle back to something you had mentioned just a a few kind of moments ago when you were talking about, you know, it might be a day, two days, three days, however long it is for a a buck to maybe check like these doe family groups when they start kind of, you know, making those kind of rut rounds, you know, so to speak. Um, And I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you pretty much hunt a singular deer like you'll pick a deer out right and like you're you're kind of hunting a, a particular mature deer during the course of a, a season is that am i is that correct statement yeah or? yeah is, that's, okay that's what i like to do is pick out specific deer and and ideally uh there would be you know a handful of deer uh, in a particular area that i would want to shoot you know but right. yes i, I if went, the past few years every buck that i have killed has been a buck that I that I knew existed and was targeting. So. Right. So so with that, you know, when you talk about them kind of making their loops and stuff like that, and especially if you have one that maybe you know maybe you've followed or have watched him, you know, for two two seasons or whatever, and and this is the year you're going to make the play on him, or he's been in the group of of the kill list for like three years or whatever, but you know maybe you tagged out prior or whatever the case is. Um, how much are you relying on kind of annual annual data? Um, to kind of know when he's going to maybe make a shift to here or, you know, he likes to hit this scrape, you know, consistently in daylight, you know, within this window of time, is there, are you kind of subscribing to some of that or, or are you really just kind of work in the woods in terms of like, uh, most recent intelligence and, you know, really setting up on hot sign or are you kind of maybe playing the long game more strategically than that? No, I, you know, I, I don't do the historical thing. I do believe that it works, you know, especially if conditions could be, you know, uh, the same, you know, from uh, one year to the next. But unfortunately, here in the mountains, it's not like that because, you know, uh, and again, it goes right back to the, uh, you know, the mast crop, you know, mm-hmm. at what elevation it's going to be at, you know, because if it's low, you know, the the bucks may bed up high, but, uh, you know, during the evening, they're going to be coming off that mountain, you know. Right. And uh, so, you know, their movement is completely different, you know, so they're going to spend a lot less time uh, moving around up high than they would down low, you know, as far as laying down signs, you know. Right. Now, uh, you know, if so if acorns are up high, then, you know, naturally they're not going to come off the mountain. And, and sometimes, you know, you may have pockets of, uh, uh, you know, mass, you know, you, you may have one ridge in several ridges up and down the main mountain that has acorns and nowhere else ever, uh, you know, around it has them. So, mm-hmm. you know, then, then that, you know, that's a premium scenario there, right? you know? Uh, so, you know, it just changes so much that, uh, you know, historical, it, it, it's, it's really hard to rely on, you know, year right. to year. Now right. I could see that working in the Midwest or somewhere like that because, you know, everything uh, is, you know, I know that they have crop rotation and stuff like that, but, you know, they can pretty much bank on some food being there every year, right. you know. And, right. uh, you know, you may have a clear cut or something other than that. That buck, you know, he's the kind of, you know, back to Andre, you know, he's mm-hmm. big on uh, bump and dump, you know. That that would not work here in the mountains because you dump, you bump him, <laughs> he's going to, he might go come to the other side of his home range, you know, and, and you'd never know where that dude went to. Right. So. Right. No, that totally makes sense. What about, so knowing that, you know, the annual thing is maybe not in play so much, you know, in, there in Virginia specifically, right? Because the, you're really relying on that, that acorn crop to help kind of build your strategy, right? Cause that's really the, the, the food source, right? What about when you do go to the Midwest, say like a big track of public in Ohio or something like that, where you're, where you're playing, playing the cut game, you know, where you're getting a lot of green briar and understory and stuff like that, that's, you know, uh, I guess browse, right. Where there's plenty of browse, no matter where they're at, that they don't have to go seek out the one acorns, but they have plenty of food wherever they might be laying. Like, is that, could you see an annual pattern playing out in those situations? Because maybe their food is a, a little bit more consistent because that clear cut's going to be good for food for probably three, maybe four years might not be great. It'd be, you know, by year five, it's usually kind of beat by that point, but at least the first three years, it's going to be a pretty decent food source. The, yeah. The, and you know, it would definitely work there. And and I know the area that you're talking about, mm-hmm. see some of those areas have cutovers and some of them don't. Right. And uh, the areas that don't, uh, 
I do not think holds bucks uh, year round. I think that uh, what sign you see there is laid down during the rut. Those bucks are probably holed up in those areas that uh, you're talking about that has a lot of cutovers. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, once the time is right and we're talking, you know, like uh, from the 25th of October on, mm-hmm. if there is acorn present in those other areas, then those bucks will start using those type of areas because, you know, there's does there. Right. They're laying down a lot of sign. You go back in there shed hunting, you know, during after the season's over with, you find almost nothing. And it's because, and you would assume because that sign was there that those bucks live there, but actually they're not. They're living back in those cutover type areas. So if you're hunting around those cutover type areas, yes, I could definitely see historical sign coming into play there, but right. not in the other areas that, uh, unless the conditions were the same, you know, it, if you have one year that you have good acorn crop, yeah. you know, and you have data for that year, the next year you have nothing in there. I don't think that uh, historical data would help you at all. Not until another year that replicated those same conditions. Right. Which sometimes almost makes places like that, like harder to hunt to a degree because you can get fooled pretty easy in my opinion. Right. By, oh yeah. You know sure. what I mean? The sign that you're seeing about whether or not it's going to be consistent or if, if you're going to be able to rely on annually, you know, the one thing that I've relied on somewhat in some of those types of areas um, to, for for annual information has been, you know, dates and times when they might hit scrapes, like a period of time, right? Because it'll tell me kind of like, you know, they like to spend some time sure, in this general yeah. area, you know, hitting this scrape within this three-day window of October, and then they're going to be back in this three-day window in November consistently or whatever. So I'll play a little bit more of that game. And I know that you like scrapes too. So you to talk to me how, you know, I guess, you know, rubs and scrapes kind of start to factor in like to your, your, your hot sign setup. I mean, is it, you know, I know you're always looking for food, but you know, do you, do you like a good rub or a good scrape more, more than the other? Uh, if I'm going to hunt one or the other, it would, gosh, I don't know that that's a tough <laughs> question there because really it depends on where the location of the scrape is or what mm-hmm. have you. But now I, I'm going to tell you really and truly Speaking from the mountains, now I've hunted Ohio and I've uh, hunted here in Virginia uh, all my life. And I can tell you that scrape, uh, hunting scrapes in southern Ohio or anywhere in Ohio is a thousand times more effective than it is here in the mountains of, of right. Virginia. Uh, right. That they, you know, you, you hear guys talk about these community scrapes and stuff like that. You, that's something that you rarely see here in the mountains and, and whenever you do find one trust me i've spent a lot of time hunting them i've had i generally always have a trail camera over them and the chance of catching a mature buck in a scrape in daylight hours is so minuscule that uh, it's not worth your time uh trying that tactic <laughs> now of course there is bucks killed that way every single year it is very uh, happenstance that, it, you know, that it, you was, it, it was your lucky day that you caught that buck there. And, right. and that's just the God's honest truth, you know. But now, Ohio is completely different, you know. In my experience, uh, from uh, the last week of October into the first few days of uh, November in Ohio is an absolute fantastic day or uh, time of the uh, season to, you know, to have opportunity at a mature buck on the scrape. Yeah. But um, it just seems like in the mountains, these bucks, that they, whenever it comes to them visiting a, a specific thing, like a scrape um, or something like that, that, they just don't like to come to that during the daylight hours for some reason. It, it would be almost like, you know, it, that doesn't mean that they don't move through the area during daylight. They just mm-hmm. don't want to come to that scrape until the cover of darkness. And, and the best analogy I can use is, you know, you live in your house. Mm-hmm. Your refrigerator is there. You know, even though that you're in the rooms all around that refrigerator, just that, that refrigerator is a very specific thing. And But mm-hmm. you don't want to go to it until you can go to it uh, in the cover of darkness you know, to visit the refrigerator. Does that make sense? No, it, it, it does. It, it totally does. You know, um, yeah, there, it's a specific use for them, right? It's not a, um, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to say it. You know, it's like, it, they, they do, it's, it's very purposeful, 
right? And so they're not just kind of yeah. willy nilly kind of going going about it. Like it serves scrapes serve a very specific kind of communication um, purpose for for whitetails, right? And that's why you'll see them yeah. on a primary scrape or whatever. That's why you'll see them hit it in the fall, the spring, the summer. You know, they'll hit licking branches. That's you right. know during all yep. you know all year round. And to me, that's like whenever I found the the money spot. Whenever I find that spot, then I'm like, this is good. And I might even, you know, in the mountains, I think you're, I think you're right. I, I think part of it too is, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, but I think part of it too, whenever you're hunting some of these big woods pieces, it's just, they're they they cover, in, at least in my experience, like so much more territory that you may sit on a scrape seven days and, it, and not make a loop back through to kind of check it, you know, in seven days. And if that seventh day happens to be at night, then you just wasted seven days. You, you know, sure. and, <laughs> you know, and so it, like, so I've been caught doing that a couple of times too. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I thought for sure, I'll just be honest this past year. I did. I had a, I had a, a good deer that was two actually that were, um, Boone and Crockett, um, that I had some annual info on. Um, and I swore up and down this deer was going to come hit this primary scrape in this three day window in November. Cause he's done it the past two years, right? Had trail camera data, like two years in a row, he's done it within the same three-day window, two times during daylight during that same three-day period. I sat that scrape for three and a half days and did not catch a sniff. Now, the last yeah. day, I heard some grunting, couldn't see him, a doe blew, I think whatever was grunting scared that doe off. It was foggy. I had a good wind. They couldn't see me. They couldn't smell me. And then whenever I went to walk out, I was changing spots. And when I walked out, I ended up busting a big deer. Couldn't, didn't know what it was. It was just a big body deer that was bedded up along this, uh, old skitter trail that was grown over that I was using as access. And he was bedded along that, or I assumed it was a, he bedded along that and blew out of there. I think that was one of the deer I was trying to go after. I think he was around to your point. <laughs> he was in the area. Just, he wasn't hitting that scrape. And, uh, yeah. you know, and I'm pretty much blew my, blew my chance at, at, you know, that particular deer, if it was, you know, if it was in, in, in fact him, you know, so how are you, I mean, how are you using scrapes then? You know, cause a lot of guys, the traditional kind of thinking is, is like you find a primary scrape area, you know, that's being hammered and set up on it and be able to shoot to it. A lot of guys, that's their strategy. Right. And it sounds like where you're at, not a great strategy. So if you're finding a sign like that and say it's hot, right, it's been tended in the past 12 hours or whatever, like what's your setup off of that? Or would you set up around well, it? Well, yeah, I would set up around it, but I'm not going to set up right over the scrape. And I'm not necessarily going to be downwind of it either, but that would definitely be a, a, a good strategy. Mm -hmm. All a scrape is to me, I would I use them for uh, trail camera data. You know, mm -hmm. I want to know who is in the area. And really and truly, that doesn't tell you the whole story of who is in the area. Because now I, I can tell you for a fact, some mature, fully mature bucks are not nearly as social as uh, others are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, some bucks can live right under your nose, and uh, you it, it doesn't matter how much you move your trail cameras around uh, on general deer sign or scrapes or anything like that. You will not get their picture. Uh, they that they that that is one reason why so only. Well, such a small percentage of hunters ever consistently kill uh, truly mature whitetail mm -hmm. is because they are so different, and people really can't wrap their mind around how different they are than the rest of the deer herd. That and and the reason it, and why I say that is is that they travel completely different. Um, and the way that I kind of, and you kind of heard this, you know, all your life too, you know, that don't hunt the heavy trails, you know, hunt the lightly yep. used trails off to the side. Yep. That is so true, but yet so few people actually take advantage of that, yep. you know, uh, and, and a lot of these places that these big bucks come through, there is so little sign there that you would, you would almost not really pick up the sign that he's leaving behind. You know, so those are the type of places that I try to key in on. Right. They're hard to hunt because really you're, you really and truly, you're going off gut instinct, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, you don't always have hard proof that that's what he's doing. Right. But you, you just have to go out on a limb 
and and start hunting differently to have a chance at these deer because i mean how many times do you do this hunt the same type of spots over and over and over and over even though you're hunting really mobile Mm -hmm. uh, you know bouncing around from hot spot to hot spot yet you have so very few chances at these big deer yeah no i i agree it's you know and i I, i've learned well this past year i've learned two painful lessons (laughs) kind of (laughs) related to that one was the one i just kind of mentioned another one was in 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 pennsylvania um it was i ended up bumping a really big deer earlier in the year um and found where it was bedded i went on a scouting mission and my goal was you know i this might be stupid i sometimes just get really aggressive and if i if i'm not 100 percent sure where that deer is that i might want to kill and this is also smaller parcels where it's you know heavily pressured you know public land in pennsylvania where i was like i gotta kick him up to find him so i know where he's at so i'm not wasting hunts around an area that he's not ever going to be in you know and where i ended up finding him i was in an area where i thought he would be but it was one it was like it was super out of the way like where you would not even think and i'm not saying i have like some type of intuition it was probably the first time it ever worked out for me that way (laughs) where i was like i'm going to go to like the most obscure place that people that you wouldn't think he would be and that's where he'll be and it just so happened to work out this time ended up not ever seeing him again and getting a getting a shot opportunity at him but i totally get what you're saying and in some of these places you will not even know you might have a big deer on camera, but like if you're in an area, you may never know he's there by the sign he's laying down. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit because I've run into that a lot. And knowing that some of these big deer lay down such minuscule sign that it's unbelievable for the size of the deer and like what you would think he would lay down based on the maturity and the size of him and stuff like that. Like I think sometimes I've definitely done this in the past that I've walked by spots that were probably good because I just didn't the sign just didn't send off my spidey senses, but it was probably the sign that I should have been really excited about. So how do you kind of, how do you kind of judge that? Right. Cause I think everyone's always looking for that big hammer rub or that big hammer scrape or whatever it is to say, there's a big deer here. How, what type of nuance are you looking for or type of sign are you looking for whenever you're looking how to, when you're looking to set up on that, on that mature deer? Well, you know, I'm like everybody else. I love seeing big sign too. Right. <laughs> but it, it really all comes back to really and truly when you're hunting these mature bucks, you're hunting a personality. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you you have some bucks that are highly social, and then you have some bucks that are very uh, unsocial. And whenever I and what I mean by uh, social and unsocial, some bucks are really aggressive. They lay down a lot of sign. And uh, then, you know, they're really advertising themselves. And then you have other bucks that are not that way, you know. Now, they still participate in the rut and stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Right, know, right. I'm, they're just, you know. Uh, so in heavily hunted areas, uh, the bucks that have that personality, uh, as far as the very social uh, personality, generally they don't last very long. You know, if they make it past two or three years old, then, uh, you know, they're very lucky. But now once they do get to that old, then, you know, just like all mature bucks, they start to change. Right. But the, the bucks that uh, have the uh, more reclusive type um, personality, they're not hanging out in the places that uh, most all the other deer, you know, are using and stuff. You know, they're around the outer skirts of it, so they're not laying down much sign. And uh, uh, so those bucks are, you know, uh, making it to maturity because uh, most of your hunters, whenever they come into those areas, they're sitting up on the heavy sign. Mm-hmm. You know, these deer are more around the fringes of that uh, type of sign, you know. So, you know, hunting the fringes of heavy sign uh, and even a little bit outside that, uh, to me, is the type of areas that I want to be in, you know. And trust your gut instinct, you know. Uh, I do not do that nearly as often as I should. I think <laughs> that I would probably be even more successful than if I did, because, you know, I'll, I'll be coming through a certain type of area and I think just maybe experiences, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, it leads me to believe that there's a big deer coming through there because I don't know how many times I've been in the woods scouting with another buddy or something other night and I would just stop and I'll say, you know what, this is, this is just an awesome looking spot right here. I can just see a big deer coming through here like this, you know, mm-hmm. and they're like, 
I, I don't see what you're seeing. You know, there's no <laughs> sign here. I, I I just can't visualize it, but for some reason I can. I you know maybe it's something God has blessed me with, or or maybe just experience. I don't know, but you know, so it it just goes back to gut instinct. You know, mostly for me. So um, you know, you, you don't. <sighs> People hunt too heavy a sign, you know, most right. of the time. And I'm guilty of it myself sometimes, you know. I, mm-hmm. I you know, I'm like all the other hunters. I love seeing big sign. Love it's hard not, it's hard it, not to get excited, you know. Yeah, for sure. It, it is. But but I've hunted it way too much in my lifetime. And I know 90% of other hunters have hunted it way too much in their lifetime to have success over it. You right. know, as far as fully mature deer, I'm talking about minimum four and a half year old deer, you know. Right. Um, so do you, do you, you think know, that, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that that's the best answer that I can give for that. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that makes sense, you know, it, cause I mean, I think just, if you think about it logically, right. It's like if people are intrigued by big sign, right. Or a, an area that has a lot of sign stands the reason that it's going to attract more people. Right. And we yeah. know, you know, whenever you're in an area that has, a fair amount of pressure, you know, deer adapt, right? What do they do? They move to areas where there aren't people, right? And so, yep. you know, and so it just stands the reason that especially the older, older, smarter ones kind of get hip to the game, you know what I mean? And they understand they've been through a couple seasons, pressure's here, exactly. they move. I've even talked to, you know, one thing I talked to, you know, Zach Farrenbaugh about at one time and it was kind of interesting and we started kind of kicking this around was almost like you'll see a first set of kind of scrapes laid down, or at least I will in PA, you know, heavy hunting pressure around here. Um, and then that first set of scrapes will almost always dry up a lot of times. And they'll almost be what I kind of referred to. And what we, he and I were talking about was almost like secondary scrape lines that open up that are just further back in the cover. And it's almost like you feel like, like they've stopped opening scrapes or they've stopped tending them. But the reality was is like the pressure moved in, started hunting that first set of scrapes in like mid October, which was probably, even if you are going to hunt scrapes, probably a little early. Right. And now they've all kind of adapted and have now moved their activity back further into the cover where there just isn't as much pressure. And I've stumbled across some of those, which was kind of interesting because I I never really thought it that thought of it that way. Now it might not apply in, you know, in the big woods where, where you're at, but it's, it's something that I've seen around here and it makes sense and kind of relates to what you're talking about. It's like people congregating to sign deer move off of it. Right. So then you're not seeing the mature deer because they've, they've learned how to play the game essentially. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, I'm probably going to get some kickback on what I'm getting ready to say, but hunting pressure doesn't cause a deer to go nocturnal. Right. Hunting yep. pressure just makes them, uh, like you said, move. Mm-hmm. and start using different uh now it, it'll make them start using a, a certain area you know uh you know during uh you know dark hours but it, it doesn't cause deer to go nocturnal a deer is deer are nocturnal nocturnal deer are uh nocturnal because it's their nature <laughs> and uh so you know that goes back to the personality again you know ideally you know you have uh, a large tract of land that is getting almost no pressure on it and you have some of these highly social bucks that grow up to be five and six year old deer and they're daylight movers and those are the ones that are uh easier to kill right you, you understand where i'm coming from yep yep no and that's totally... because you know that yeah because they're not getting killed when you know uh because of their social activity they're not getting killed whenever they're younger you know, so they're able to reach, you know, older age. And, uh, and see, that's what happens, uh, believe it or not, on uh, leased property, you know, that's been managed for several years. Mm-hmm. You know, you see on TV these guys hunting food plots and these bucks, you know, giant bucks walking right out in the middle of these food plots, you know. All that is is that is a deer that is more social than, uh, you know, uh, some of the other mature bucks. I guarantee you mm-hmm. that those uh, same pieces of properties have bucks that they get nothing but uh, nighttime pictures of and it's book and it's not because of the hunting pressure it's because that is just their nature yeah. you know so no i totally i totally agree with you with that it, it i feel the same about um the october lull you know it's like people are like well deer just aren't moving it's like well no they're moving 
you know, you're, you're dealing with what you were talking about earlier, actually, where it's like acorns are now dropping. They have food in different places. So they've moved off where you typically have seen them or maybe you've gotten pictures of them and you're not hunting the best stuff today. You're hunting the best stuff from a week ago. You know, right. you know what I mean? And then people will be like, oh, the deer went nocturnal or they're not moving. It's like, well, you're just probably in the wrong spot, you know, and that's kind yeah. of where that scout to hunt type of mentality and being willing to move and find where they're at, you know, kind of becomes, um, you know, becomes really important. But, uh, yeah, it, it, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, during October, if you know where he's at, then you should be able to kill that deer. Right. If uh, if you don't know where he's at, then your your chances of killing him are almost zero. Right. You know, unless you're just highly mobile, moving around, and happen to move in to just the right spot to catch him. But if you know where he's at, you know he's not moving very far. He's really shrunk down his uh, core area. Uh, you know, and this is you know early October, uh, late September time frame. You know, mm-hmm. that, that is definitely your best opportunity to kill uh, a very specific deer. Right. But you got to know where he's at. If you don't, then you're just SOL. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I feel like for a lot of people probably wander around early se- or late September, early October, SOL. <laughs> you know, it's like. Yeah. I, yeah. I, where in the heck did that deer go? To? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I spend a lot of that time of year trying to find the one that I'm looking for. Because a lot of times, truthfully, it's like, you know, I'll have a group of deer like I did this year. And, and I've said this in previous podcasts, this year was actually a pretty red, you know, pretty banner year for me in PA as far as like quality of deer to hunt. I had the best quality of deer to hunt in the state of Pennsylvania that I've ever had in my life. You know, I had a couple really, really good deer, um, you know, two of them that would be, all, you know, really good deer probably by most state standards, just generally speaking for, for public land almost anywhere. Um, and the one I had an idea and I already kind of told you about that one, like ended up kicking him up and you know, that was kind of game over. And that was like the very beginning of October because I knew there was going to be pressure in the area. And I knew I probably had a really small window, um, to, to try to kill him in. And then there was another one where I had a pretty good idea where he was at and he just kept, uh, I had a truck camera in the general area. And so I knew, I saw him in the summer and he disappeared and I just had like a feeling he was going to be back in this particular area. And, um, he did come back in, in like, uh, I think it was like the second week of October or something like that. And, uh, I missed him by a day both times. I was there on a Saturday. He came through on, he came in the general area on a Sunday and the way he came in would have been, you know, close to where I was set up and, and generally speaking, however, you know, far down that travel corridor, I would have been set up. And, uh, but we, we can't hunt on Sundays in Pennsylvania. So the following week had same weather conditions. I went and hunted him again. Um, and he showed up on Sunday again. So, so two different times oh, yeah. I missed him for, <laughs> by a day. If I could have hunted Sunday, I would have killed him either, either day, essentially. Wow. Um, yeah. you know, but you know, it's just, uh, you know, but I had another one that disappeared. He was a really good deer and I, I had him on camera and I knew generally where he was spending time. And then he just vanished kind of like what you were talking about, you know, and I had no clue where he went. So I spent a couple of different days just scouting, looking, you know, on this side of this one mountain, trying to figure out where he was at, like all the hidey holes that I thought he might hold up in and stuff like that, but just never came across him again. And then I ended up getting a picture of him in like November while I was in Missouri. Um, and so he ended yeah. up coming, coming back, but you know, you just never know, man, those old, and these were the older deer that were in the area too, you know, for, you know, the one was probably four. Um, and that's a good deer for PA and the other two are probably three and a half year olds, which around here, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty good around here. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and hell while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. I'd be super appreciative if you'd be able to do those two things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Maven Optics. And until next time, we'll see y'all.